Hi, I'm Lynn Cornell, and welcome to Journey Through the Bible Verse by Verse. And we're in part two of our study through the 11th chapter of John. And we're going to pick it up uh, in verse 28. And if you remember, the chapter opens up with Jesus receiving news that his personal friend, Lazarus, is gravely ill. Um, the, the, the mere fact that he receives the message means that he is gravely ill and that he should respond at once. He should come at once. once. And in Mary, and in Martha's mind, is to get there before he dies. Because in their minds, death is permanent, as in most of us in our case, death is final, it's, death is permanent. So Jesus purposely, purposely stays behind for two days. And so by the time he arrives in Bethany, Lazarus has been dead for four days. And of course, back in those days, um, you only, um, if you died, you was immediately buried. If you died at 12 o'clock, you probably was buried by one. I mean, certainly you didn't have much more time after that. They didn't have any bombing fluids. And if it was hot and warm, they knew that that body was going to start decay and stink. So they got you into the ground or in a tomb ASAP. Um, the exception is that if you were rich, you probably could afford some expensive embalming procedures that they had that would prolong the body. Know that Egyptians, for example, there's mummified bodies that it's, that it, that's fascinating to see thousands of years after uh, the, uh, the the death of some of these kings. But anyway, the common person didn't have that. So um, when Jesus arrives, Lazarus has been dead for four days. So actually, it's a done deal. It's over. Mary hears that he's. Uh, Martha hears that he's here, uh, that he has arrived in town. She rushes out. Mary sits, still sits there, which is interesting. Why? In terms of why does Mary kind of responds that way? So Martha comes and says, "If you had been here, my brother would not have died." And in verse twenty-five, I'm just going to read this again. He says, "Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life.'" The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you ever believe that? The, the ideal of this statement here, obviously, is that in Jesus, and certainly he's not referring to physical death. Why? Lazarus is dead. And even, remember in the first uh, part of the chapter, verse 1, he receives the news that Lazarus is gravely ill, and Jesus himself makes the statement, this sickness will not end in death. Well, Lazarus died, <laughs> right? Jesus himself says to the disciples, we're going to go to Bethany and raise our friend Lazarus from the dead. In other words, he's dead. So the, the, the obvious thing is that Jesus is not referring to death in a sense as um, and the, in, in other words, the way he's looking at death is a lot different. He's looking at it on a different plane than just the physical death. All right, so he tells um, Martha that, and then now she kind of rushes back. First, and we're going to pick it up in verse 28. Having said this, she went back and called her sister, Mary, saying in private, the teacher has, is here and is calling for you. And as soon as she heard that, she got up quickly and went to him. Jesus had not, had not yet come into the village, but was, was still in the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, that saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. So they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to cry there. And of course, these were professional uh, comforters. They would cry and wail and probably make you feel even worse from them being there. Verse 32, when Mary came to where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying. He was angry in his spirit and deeply moved. Now, remember I told you to remember this verse um, um, when Jesus said, um, 
Oh, let me go back here. Verse 4, that this sickness will not end in death, but it's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified thereby. And um, the reason why I wanted to say that is that um, notice he says that he was angry. Now, why was he angry? Well, because there was such a sense of hopelessness here. Despite all of the works that Jesus had done. So verse 34, where have you put him? He asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. Jesus wept. Now, of course, trivially, but trivial, this is the shortest verse in the Bible. Um, I'm not going to belabor this. However, I do not believe that Jesus was overcome with grief. Now, now just imagine this for a moment. If I, if I was out of town and, and somebody told me, hey, your wife has died. Okay, so yes, I would be devastated, but suppose an angel appeared to me and said, you're going to go back and you're going to pray for your wife and you're going to raise her from the dead. So don't, you know, take heart, your wife, you know, yes, she's died, but you're going to raise her from the dead. Now at that point, I'm happy. I'm expecting, right? And if I come back and I would see that my children would be devastated, grandkids would be devastated, would I be overcome with grief knowing that I'm getting ready to raise her from the dead? See? So that's why I don't believe that Jesus, when it says Jesus wept, I don't believe that he was overcome with grief here. Verse 36. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, angry in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave. And the stone was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. Now, notice he was angry uh, in the sense how people sort of taunted him. Well, couldn't this man have kept this man from dying? He opens the eyes of the blind, which, by the way, to me, would seem to be at the heart of Jesus' anger. Notice the statement. Couldn't this man be? Couldn't this man? I'm going to go back and read verse 36 again because I think this is kind of worth reading. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. Right? Now what are they seeing? I guess it's the question here. What is it that they're watching to me? But some of them said, couldn't he, have, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? On the one hand, they acknowledge, and by the way, John doesn't get into the other instances that Jesus has raised people from, from the dead. And remember, he's known for this. He's known for raising people from the dead. So the question is, when they make a statement like this, He's not overcome with grief. He's overcome with anger. All right. Um, verse 39. Remove the stone, Jesus said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, he's already decaying. It's been four days, right? So what happened to that? Yes, Lord, I believe whatever you say. Verse 40. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believe you would see the glory of God? So they removed the stone and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me. But, but because of the crowd standing here, I said it so they may believe that you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. So Jesus knew all along what he was going to do. And he's saying that the reason why we're doing this so they may believe. That, that is why this sign, this miracle is happening. Verse 44, the dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. Quick trivial note here. Notice that Lazarus has his complete grave wrapping, which includes a head wrapping. Now, the scriptures will not make the parallel or the connection. 
The only reason why I'm making the correct, correct connection here is that when Jesus is raised from the dead, you're going to see his head piece, grave clothes, in a separate place, folded. Okay? I just wanted to make the thing here. Now, verse 45, Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Interesting, isn't that? Here is this marvelous miracle. This man has been dead for four days. Everybody knows he's been dead for four days, right? This is, you know, you don't hear about this, right? And as Mary even said, especially when you're talking about a warmer temperature, um, a body will start uh, decaying in a matter of hours if you, you don't refrigerate it. And he's been in the ground four days. And yet, they ran to the Pharisees. <laughs> Verse 47, So the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the Sanhedrin and said, What are we going to do since this man does many signs? If we let him continue in this way, everyone will believe in him. Then the Romans will come and remove both our place and our nation. Now that's sort of a legitimate kind of concern for them in that if seditions happen, if they revolt, then the Romans would take away their freedoms. So that's part of it. Part of it is they would take away their their freedoms. They, uh, the Pharisees enjoyed great prestige under the Roman rules. But as we know, that the biggest part is they're just jealous. 49. One of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You're not considering that it's to our advantage that one man should die for the people rather than the whole nation perish. He did this, he, he did not say this on his own, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. Now he's attributing uh, 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 the high priest's statements and he is saying that God is kind of using this as a prophecy. Um, about the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 42, I mean 52, and not for the nation only, but also to unite the scattered children of God. Now, the scattered children of God here should probably be a reference to the children of Israel that were scattered around the, around the world from the Babylonian, uh, since, I should say since the Babylonian uh, invasion. Verse 53, so from that day, they plotted to kill him. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but departed from there to the countryside near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim. And he stayed there with his disciples. The Jewish Passover was near, and many went up to Jerusalem from the countryside, purifying themselves before the Passover. And they were looking for Jesus and asking one another as they stood in the temple complex, what do you think? He won't come to the festival, will he? The chief priest and the Pharisee had given orders. If anyone knew where he was, he should report him so they could arrest, arrest him. So it's amazing. One of the most glorious uh, miracles that Jesus, could, that Jesus performed. And you see this plot developing. That's amazing. But we, again, we constantly see the um, hardness of men, the the hardness of the sin, the, the, the contaminated, the depraved heart. And again, as people oftentimes say, if I see a miracle, or if I just saw a miracle, or here was a miracle that was done where man was raised from the dead. By the way, if you notice, the Pharisees don't even contest if the miracle ever happened. Again, that is one of the most astounding things about what they are doing. All right. So um, we're going to pick this up and again, continue our study in the uh, 12th chapter of John. And so we will, I'll see you in chapter uh, 12 next time.